Côté Ségéborg. Ok. Alright, so let me uh, begin the introduction. Uh, so once again, uh, thanks everybody for joining to, uh, the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminars. Uh, this is an initiative between the SPIN Phenomenon and the Plus Analytics Center SPICE, uh, led by myself and Kairi Nebesho Site, and the SPIN Plus X consortium uh, between Cassis Latin and Mines, uh, and the co organizers here, Martin Ashim and uh, Brooker Hillebrands and Matthias Chloe. Um, that we've joined to make this series uh, of uh, very uh, high-end uh, speakers uh, on spintronics, on the latest physics of anti-spintronics, uh, particularly the latest nature uh, level, uh, science level uh, results. And um, we have, this is a Zoom webinar format. Uh, for those of you, most of you, maybe you experienced already with it, it's just that uh, when you come in, you don't have the microphone on, but you can ask questions that I can monitor during the talk. Uh, typically, once Enrique the Marco starts, uh, once the speaker starts, I will not stop the speaker unless, unless there is a question that is very specific that will help to we'll clarify something. Uh, otherwise, I will try not to stop the speaking until the end. Um, and then I will go through the, the this questions that you may have written during the talk and pass along and allow you to talk to the speaker directly and format, uh, phrase your question. If you cannot speak, I will read the question directly to the speaker and the speaker will, uh, Enrique will, will answer. Um, we have this seminar always at, at 3 p.m. Obviously, if you've come managed to log in, you know it. Um, and, uh, and once again, to, um, for the next, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the title from Stuart Parkins talk as usual. Uh, it will give it the, the hopefully it will give it to me soon and then I will announce it next week. Uh, and Emil Jacobi uh, next and uh, Yuli go here afterwards as well. Uh, so we look forward to all of you to attend uh, whenever you can. And as you know, these are also live stream on, on the YouTube channel of Spice and uh, available after uh, in the YouTube channel of Spice as well. Um, let me uh, introduce here the, the speaker. Uh, let's go here. Uh, Enrique del Barco is a well-known uh, researcher in magnetism, and particularly in optical regime uh, and uh, time-dependent, uh, time-domain uh, spectroscopy uh, of magnetism um, and uh, terahertz spectroscopy. Um, he's been now he's been in the University of Central Florida, a professor for quite a while. He's actually now associate dean as well on top of leading a very, very active uh, team. And he leads uh, into Florida, a, a MURI, which is equivalent to our SPIN plus X, uh, in to, uh, with seven or eight uh, participants at universities in, to, um, in, the, in the US, uh, spanning all the way from the East Coast to the, to the West Coast almost, and, and Midwest as well. Um, he's a Spaniard like me, of, uh, so that's also very nice. Uh, and shares with me a very a love, passion to, uh, for wine, and, uh, and we both have a very nice cellars. So that's, that's another thing that we share. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, uh, stop sharing my uh, camera. I'm going to also record this uh, on the cloud here. And uh, um, uh, Enrique, whenever you would like, uh, you can go ahead and start your talk. Uh, so uh, thank sure. You. Thanks, Cairo, very much for the introduction. Uh, yes, actually, it's, it's, I have to say that it's a very nice initiative for you guys to have this online. Uh, we cannot do much, uh, not leaving the houses, so being able to attend these conferences are actually a very nice thing. But I have to say that I prefer to go to Germany so that I can taste your wines. So I want to stop going to your, to your um, meetings there. All right, see, yes, I, I'm going to talk about uh, very recent results that we have obtained on a, an insulating antiferromagnet, and we have demonstrated um, coherent screen pumping at frequencies almost up to uh, up to terahertz. A work done in collaboration with the groups of David Leatherman in the University of California, Santa Cruz, Ran Cheng, uh, University of California, Riverside, Arnie Bradas in uh, Norway, and Hans Van Toll in the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in Tallahassee, Florida. But I'm an associate dean of the College of Sciences in the University of Central Florida in Orlando. So I, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about us. Um, and I use this opportunity to introduce my group and my, 
my college and my university. This is a beautiful view of the Florida Peninsula uh, that sometimes looks like that. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of hurricanes in, in the area. They, they're supposed to come in one or two months from now. Uh, but now it looks even uglier with the virus and protests. So it's not a very nice, uh, pleasant uh, place to be. Anyways, back to the nice uh, Florida Peninsula. Uh, here's where we are, Orlando, in the middle of the peninsula. Um, we live next to Mickey Mouse. Uh, we actually live like four hours drive from the, from the magnet lab in where these experiments that I will show you uh, have been performed. Uh, the College of Sciences is actually really large. We have 12,000 students. Uh, this makes us larger than 50% of the universities in the country. Uh, we're very, very well known for space uh, science, in particular planetary science. We have strong links with uh, NASA, that is a 45 minutes drive from us in Port Canaveral. We're also very well known for coastal science, and you can tell, I mean, we only have coast. We don't have anything else here. And also turtles like to come to our beaches to, for, uh, to do their nest and keep their offspring. And um, maybe a little more related to, uh, to, to Spintronics, and we're trying to do this collaboration with our, our uh, Atosecond guys in the physics department. We have actually the record fastest sorters, uh, laser pools that you can imagine, really stable pulses, very high power. Uh, a quick look at my group. Um, it's, it's actually a pleasure to be surrounded by such a set of brilliant junior minds. Uh, we focus on three main areas. One is molecular magnetism. In particular, we, we uh, study the quantum dynamics of spins in uh, single molecule magnets. I've been working on this since I graduated in Barcelona. Uh, uh, we more recently over the last decade we have focused on molecular electronics in particular we look into uh, charge rectification in uh, molecular tunnel junctions and then of course we do uh, spintronics at different scales um, and we're now very very focused on studying uh, spintronics uh, effects in uh, with the use of antiferromagnetic materials in particular antiferromagnetic insulators um, uh, Priyanka is the, the, the lady in my group who just graduated and moved to work for Intel and many of my former PhD students are now working for Intel in Portland um, and, and she's the one that made the experiment that I will show you at the very end. But as Jairo um, uh, mentioned, this is actually part of a larger collaboration <clears throat> funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research through a multi University Research Interdisciplinary Team, they call. It's a grant. It's a large grant that reunites uh, seven PIs from six different institutions and uh, about eight uh, external collaborators uh, that allows us to bring together a really interdisciplinary and complementary set of expertise in experimental physics and uh, materials and theory. So this is working very, very nicely. We have associations with several national labs uh, and we, we already obtaining very beautiful results and that's the one that I will show you later today. Now, Jairo wants a, a contextualization of the experiments and uh, this is a broad audience. So I'm, I'm gonna give you, uh, the, the, the introduction per se is actually long because I really need to explain a few things for the experiments to be understood. But then I have added some um, historical perspective to this talk. So when we talk about spintronics, we basically talk about ferromagnetic spintronics. So it's basically using the spin degree of freedom uh, and ferromagnetic materials that are kind of easy to work with. Uh, so if we want to look into the history of that, we have to go all the way down to the two centuries ago and uh, where Lord Kelvin uh, in 1851 actually uh, realized that the ma a magnetic field could could change the resistance of the material, the electric resistance of the material. And then later on uh, in 1856 demonstrated, well, came with the first demonstration of magneto resistance in iron. It was only 5%, so it was not really useful at that time. We had to wait a long time until uh, these guys, uh, Albert Fert and Peter Gumber, uh, published their results on the giant magnet resistance, 80%. Now we have much larger than that. And then so now we can, we could start thinking about uh, real applications in technology. But <coughs> if you take 
And actually, this is something I will do several times in this talk. If you take the, the Newton's laws, uh, so actually something that Sanosinski and then Berger later did in this uh, case, you can say, well, if the, if the magnetization of a material can affect, can affect the, the, the electrical current and change the resistance, uh, you could expect the same thing from the third Newton, so it's action reaction, right? So, so uh, you should expect also that if you use a, po a magnetically polarized charge current and you pass it through a magnetic material, the charge current is going to affect the magnetization state and induce dynamics uh, in the in the magnetic material, and and this is known as spin transfer torque, and it leads to <clears throat> applications like, for example, in magnetic uh, round memories, right? In where one could envision a, what is known as a spin transfer torque spin bar, in where we have three layers. One is a polarizer, magnetic polarizer, uh, spaced from a free layer called, it's another magnetic, a magnetic layer that is spaced uh, by a, a non-magnetic uh, conductor. And then charge current flows through the device, get the, the <clears throat> electron, uh, the spins of the conduction electrons get polarized by the first layer. <clears throat> that magnetic polarization is transferred to the, I have a fan here that is just making me cough. Um, it's transferred to the free layer and the spin transfer, the uh, uh, torque in the free layer um, generates dynamics in the, in the free layer and actually even can reverse the magnetization, the, the magnetization direction. And this is basically the principle of operation of a spin bar, right? Well, this was demonstrated shortly after. Um, I chose this because uh, I was there. This was done by my friend, uh, Barbara Sothil Matt, uh, in 2003, working for my former postdoc advisor in New York University. And I was there when I, while these experiments were demonstrated. So in, in the same way that you can switch the magnetization state of magnetic material by applying a magnetic field, then they demonstrated that you can do the same thing with charged current through the spin transfer torque effect. Now, another, another um, uh, potential use of this would be that under some circumstances, you can actually uh, induce a precessional dynamics in the magnetic material through uh, spin transfer torque. So you have to pass a DC charged current through your material and that charged current through the spin transfer torque will generate a dynamical uh, a magnetic dynamics in the in the magnetic material, and in ferromagnets, this has been demonstrated already. And you can see how actually the frequency of those oscillations. This is a basically a gigahertz oscillator, oscillator, uh, range in uh, span into a few uh, gigahertz. And this is basically uh, depending on the external applied field, right? Um, all right. So what do we? had to add if we replace the ferromagnets by antiferromagnets. Well, uh, antiferromagnets have exchange interactions that are dominating the dynamics. So the frequency of operation lies um, indeed within the terahertz gap. That is a, that is a, a, you know, a range of frequencies in the electromagnetic radiation spectrum that is actually difficult to, uh, to generate uh, artificially. Then they don't have straight fields because they don't have a net magnetization. So they, they, they will prevent cross talk between different units in, in your circuit. You can space them uh, closer together. Indeed, <clears throat> the, the uh, wavelength of magnons uh, at these high frequencies actually are in the nanoscale. So the circuits or magnet magnetic circuits can be really, really small. Uh, indeed, the group velocity of magnons is proportional to the square root of the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the faster data transmission rates to with speed. And of course, if we are talking about high frequency into the terahertz, if we were able to control the magnetization of the magnetic state of the antiferromagnet uh, electrically, we should be able to uh, perform operations into the picosecond region. That is two to three orders of magnitude larger than what is available now with ferromagnetic uh, based spintronic devices. All right, so. Um, there is, there is something that we're just uh, um, trying to demonstrate experimentally uh, that is actually easy to see when we compare an antiferromagnet and a ferromagnet when it comes down to um, uh, magnetic dynamics, right? So if we take a, a ferromagnet and, and we talk about ferromagnetic resonance that is uh, you know, 
it's a phenomenon that is very well known in ferromagnetism, we, we, we will quickly see that the ferromagnetic resonance frequency actually is determined by a convolution of the apply externally, the externally applied magnetic field and the dipolar or anisotropy energy or, man, or magnetic fields inside the sample, right? And this is what with the standard magnetic fields that we can apply in laboratories, let's say one Tesla, uh, it will allow us to, to work within uh, ten, uh, one to 20 gigahertz, let's say, right? This is very well known. And of course the same thing happens with an antiferromagnet, but in the case of an antiferromagnet, the dynamics are governed by the exchange interaction and the anisotropy um, uh, energy. Anisotropy energy is small, uh, similar to the ones that we find in ferromagnets. But the exchange interaction, uh, if we look, for example, at the effective exchange field in antiferromagnetic materials, can be as much as three uh, as one thousand uh, tesla. That is about three orders of magnitude larger than than the uh, than the external fields that we can apply in ferromagnets, right? So the dynamics that we expect of this. Uh, entangled, well, entangled, you know, couple uh, solaris magnetizations are going to lie in the range between a few hundred gigahertz up and several terahertz. And, and this is what happens with antiferromagnetic resonance, but this is known as exchange in amplification. So basically the anisotropy, the internal energies of the magnet, uh, of the, of the antiferromagnet are amplified by this, this strong exchange coupling that we have. This actually happens with anything any magnetic perturbation that you add to the system. So for example, if we're talking about injecting a spin current into an antiferromagnet and expecting the spin transfer torque to add into the sublattice magnetizations, that is small um, perturbation, magnetic perturbation that lead to gigahertz uh, frequency dynamics in ferromagnets will now be amplified by the exchange interaction and lead to uh, terahertz dynamics in, in some cases. And the way to think about this is like, well, now you think about an uh, antiferromagnet in equilibrium, the two solarises are aligned and anti-parallel to each other. And then we add the perturbation. We tilt the, the, the solaris magnetizations slightly. Uh, we can them into a given direction. And now they will feel a huge internal exchange field that will make them to rotate very quickly. Indeed, the frequency of rotation can be tuned by the, the, the strength of the of the uh, of the perturbation, and uh, there's two proposals, theoretical proposals of a terahertz antiferromagnetic oscillator, uh, one by Ran Chain and collaborators, and the other one by Andre Slavin and collaborators. I'm going to explain one of them, and it's illustrated in this device, right? So this is an antiferromagnet. It's an easy plane antiferromagnet, actually biaxial uh, antiferromagnet with a hard axis. So the hard axis is directed parallel to the interface in this direction. The easy plane is perpendicular to the interface between the antiferromagnet and an adjacent heavy metal like platinum, right? So the principle of operation here is, well, now we have charged current flowing through platinum. The spin hole effect is gonna inject spin current perpendicular to the interface into the antiferromagnet and with the magnetization, the polarization direction parallel to the interface and parallel to the hard axis. That is going to tilt the solaris magnetizations away out of the easy axis that is in the plane. And uh, the exchange field is going to make this to oscillate in a plane that is perpendicular to the, to the interface between the two materials. That oscillation is going to generate uh, an oscillating electric field that is going to radiate terahertz radiation out of in space. Uh, this is described by these two couple um, LLG equations in where you, you have the first term that actually couples every solaris magnetization with the other one uh, through H1. So M1 and M2 are coupled here in this fashion. And then of, and the same thing for the other solaris magnetization. And then we have the anisotropy. In this case, it's a biaxial EC plane anisotropy um, uh, system. Then we have the Gilbert damping <clears throat> characterized by the Gilbert damping parameter. And uh, that is one actually of the reasons that for, for which we use uh, insulating antiferromagnets because damping is, is, is substantially smaller than uh, in conducting uh, antiferromagnets. And then uh, we have the spin torque term, term. And that is basically the coupling of the uh, polarization 
of the spin polarization from the spin current by, uh, to the two sub lattices. Well, if you look at what happens with the Neil vector, that is the order parameter in these materials, defined as the uh, subtraction between the two sub lattice magnetizations, normalized subtraction, uh, you find that this is actually going to oscillate with time. And the parameter that describes this oscillation can be written uh, or uh, found by solving this uh, equation. This equation is actually the second Newton's law, uh, in where we have the mass times the acceleration equals the net force acting on your system. So we have several forces in our system. We have a resistive force that is proportional to the speed, and it's basically the magnetic damping, uh, and this is the Gilbert damping. Then we have the recovery force that is kind of a hook slow, uh, but uh, different because we have a trigonometric, I mean, it's proportional to the displacement, although it's trigonometric, uh, uh, it, it, the relation comes with, a, with this uh, sign of the displacement, right? So it will give you, uh, it will give rise to some kind of os uh, oscillatory potential. And then we have the feeding force that, that is basically the spin torque, right? That is proportional to the charge current flowing through platinum. Well, actually, this equation is very common in physics. Uh, it's known as the tilt uh, was was power potential, uh, and it is described by many systems, like for example RC Josephson junctions or a, to a classical torque pendulum. will describe these things, in where you know we have local minima for the system to be, and then it we it was the some inertia, right? That it would go uh, and we push the system, it will start going down the layer, the ladder. Okay, so. If we analyze the results, actually, we'll find that we have two regimes. And the two regimes are separated by a threshold current, right? So a threshold current, actually, that depends on the anisotropy of the, of the antiferromagnet and the and sigma. That is basically the efficiency in converting charge current into a spin current, or the spin hole uh, angle, if you want. So above a threshold current, we are in the supercritical regime in where the current actually drives the dynamics of the system. So you'll see uh, after some time of application of this uh, spin current, for example, we have the system oscillating naturally at a particular frequency. And indeed, uh, we, we, it's, it's easy to see that the frequency of oscillation is actually going to depend almost linearly with the current density uh, flowing through platinum, through the ideation material. And, and you can actually also tell that this, this frequency can be tuned in a very broad range of frequencies from 0 0.2 to 0.8 here, but you know you can go farther away. And then of course you can change the slope of here of this curve by changing materials, et cetera. But it's also interesting to be in the subcritical regime in where the system will just follow some inertial dynamics. It's basically the first Newton law, right? So, so we're here, we don't have enough power, enough energy to give to the system to go over the barrier. Uh, but then if we stay here with a DC current be below the threshold, and then we send a little pulse of current extra, and then we'll get the, the system jumping, and then uh, it will emit uh, a, a, an electrical signal in a very, very short uh, period of time. So it's one way of uh, generating uh, very fast picosecond spikes of current that may actually become very interesting for some applications, for example, neuromorphic computing. Uh, computation and things like that. All right, so this is very nice. So what do we need in order to realize that? And I, I'm not going to demonstrate this today, but uh, this is one is what is driving our our team, right? Well, it's not easy. Uh, we need to work with single domain antiferromagnets. Those are not really trivial to obtain. We re we need a very specific uh, symmetry of uh, and relation between the magnetic and isotropy and the device configuration. The the spin current should be polarized in a particular direction with respect to the anisotropy axis. We really need to decrease the anisotropy uh, because we need to have low threshold currents, uh, for example, some. And at the same time, we, we want to increase the efficiency in injecting spin into the antiferromagnet. Uh, some quick calculations by the authors on platinum nickel oxide um, uh, tell us that they need 10 to the 8 or more amps per centimeter square flowing through platinum in order to overcome this threshold. And this is actually a very high current that is basically going to melt the platinum. So we're looking for other variations of uh, symmetries, materials, etc., in order to get this a little more efficient with lower currents. 
I will continue with my introduction. I told you it was going to be a long introduction. All right, so uh, I'm just portraying two of the most common tools that people in Spintronics use to control the magnetic state of the system is the combination of the spin hole effect that actually converts charge current into spin current and the spin transfer torque effect that is basically that spin current that we inject in a magnetic material would induce dynamics, right? That's one way of controlling the magnetization. But again, back to the third Newton's law, we have the reciprocal effects of both of these effects that would allow us to do exactly the same physics, right? Uh, the inverse spin hole effect actually converts spin current into charge current and the dynamical spin pumping uh, converts magnetization dynamics into a spin, into a DC spin current, right? So if we if we join these two effects in a device uh, and we have a magnetic material, or in this case an antiferromagnetic material undergoing some magnetic dynamics, and it's uh, a heavy metal adjacent to the to the antiferromagnet, the spin current that we generate dynamically by pumping spin angular momentum in every cycle of the oscillation will be converted into a charge current. And it gives us a very nice way, a very nice way to to uh, characterize the phenomenon. I had to continue my introduction. I had to explain what an, a uniaxial ant antiferromagnet is because indeed we have studied manganese diafluoride. It's a family of the antiferromagnetic fluoride systems uh, that is a prototypical uh, uniaxial antiferromagnet. And it's important for me to explain this because it will come up later with the results. If you run the free energy uh, in the microscope approximation and you solve the equations of motion, you will find that these are actually experimental results obtained almost uh, 30 years ago. Um, you obtain that you can solve analytically this problem and the resonance frequency will actually uh, behave in this particular way. So, so at zero field, when this term is zero, you will still have a zero field splitting. So, there is a fundamental mode in an antiferromagnet, the generator, that has high frequency. In uh, manganese difluoride, is 260 gigahertz. In iron difluoride, for example, is higher than 1.1 1 1, 1 terahertz. I believe it's 1.4 terahertz or something like that. But then, when we apply a magnetic field, the Seaman interaction actually makes, separates, um, breaks the degeneracy between two different antiferromagnetic modes. The right handed mode. Uh, goes up in energy, while the left-handed mode uh, goes down in energy. The difference between these oscillatory modes is that the solaris magnetizations, the solaris uh, magnetizations, will describe different cone uh, precession cone angles. So the one in uh, the one that it goes up in energy, basically, um, the resulting magnetization that goes down opposes the magnetic field. And the, goes, the one that goes down in frequency, uh, the resulting magnetization, because one cone is smaller, so the projection into the C-axis is larger, um, goes with the magnetic field, right? And this um, splitting is linear, as you can tell here, until we get to a point that is known as the spin float transition, in where the magnetic field is strong enough to make the two solarises to go perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? And uh, beyond that, we talk about the quasi-ferromagnetic mode. So the system starts behaving as a ferromagnet somehow. Uh, so this, this sub transition this, between these two regimes, these two regimes can be solved analytically. And, and in this case, as you can tell, the, the, the system actually uh, develops a, an equilibrium magnetic, magnetic moment. And this is because once you are perpendicular, you have the solar magnetizations perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, the magnetic field will can then slightly towards its direction and an equilibrium magnetization will develop. So this is intrinsically different behavior here with an equilibrium net moment from here that is a net moment that is only dynamical. If the system is not undergoing uh, antiferromagnetic resonance, there is no net magnetization below, below the spin flow transition. And the last thing I had to explain as an introduction is uh, what to expect from this material. So what, what, what to expect when we, uh, uh, when we put together an antiferromagnet with a, with a non-magnetic material adjacent to it, and uh, we write the antiferromagnet into uh, stable dynamics or coherent dynamics, right? the antiferromagnetic resonance. 
Well, this has been studied by Ran Chen and Andri Arne Bradas, are actually co-authors of the paper in where we have published our results. And they did a kind of simple analysis to begin with by separating the two solaris magnetizations and calculating the spin current, the spin pumping that you would expect from it uh, in this fashion. And then uh, after some realizations of the, uh, like basically um, taking into account that the two solaris magnetizations are the same, and the same thing happens for the dynamics, the time, the independence of these two. So when we when we uh, rewrite this uh, equation in terms of the nil vector or the staggered magnetization, we can uh, we can drive the spin current as a function of the nil vector, right? But of and and with it leads to this description a little more uh, formal here than in my previous slide, in where you know one magnetization solaris will uh, process with a larger cone than the other. And then uh, for the right-handed mode, for the left-handed mode, uh, it will just happen the, the opposite thing. And if this is the AC axis and the magnetic field is applied in this direction, well, this mode will be lower, more stable in, in energy, and this will be less stable in energy. But one, another thing that you can realize here is that because of this uh, different precession cone angle between these two, um, magnetization, uh, so lattice magnetizations, you will also have a magnetic, a magnetic moment, a net magnetic moment oscillating in this plane, right? Because there will be a magnetic moment uh, fixed going down because this projection is larger into the C-axis than this, right? But also there's something that is going to change. So we cannot neg neg neglect that. Also it's in a much smaller term. So when you run the results, the uh, for at resonance, so you just hit the antiferromagnetic resonance. The spin pumping that is expected, um, indeed, actually, is going to be similar, theoretically, to that that you would expect from a ferromagnetic material. And this is something that you can be seen here. A compensated interface basically means that the last layer uh, of the antiferromagnet adjacent to the non-magnetic non layer is a ferromagnet, is a, is an antiferromagnetic layer. And an uncompensated interface is just basically the last layer is a ferromagnetic arrangement. And with, with they don't see very substantial difference and they spread the spin mixing conductance on the order of one uh, uh, quantum conductance unit, as you can say here. And actually, as I will show you, the results tell us the same thing. But very interesting in antiferromagnets that doesn't happen with ferromagnets is the fact that the polarization uh, nature of the mode uh, sets whether you have a spin pumping or not. So only circularly polarized antiferromagnetic modes, dynamical modes, will lead to spin pumping. If the mode is linearly polarized, it won't get, uh, it, won't, it won't generate any spin pumping. And the other thing is that the effect, the spin pumping, is going to be proportional to the ratio between the anisotropy and the exchange fields. And uh, this can vary substantially. For example, in manganese difluoride, the one that we have studied, uh, the anisotropy energy is uh, about three times, uh, three orders of magnitude smaller than the exchange interaction. And the spin pumping, um, the spin current uh, expected from that at any field, these are different fields, uh, is gonna be much smaller than, for example, in iron difluoride, in where the anisotropy energy is comparable to the exchange interaction. You know. So one would like to work with iron diafluoride. We didn't do this, not because we, we're not, uh, we, we don't know what we do, right? It's just because the, the frequency of oscillation of this guy is much larger and it's not accessible with our um, techniques. So we have to restrict our experiments with manganese diafluoride for the moment. All right, now introduction is over. I'm gonna start uh, discussing the results. This, as I say, was done in the magnet lab in Tallahassee, Hans Van Toll actually takes care of this system, it's a beautiful system. It allows you to work at different frequencies. The ones that we have used are uh, in the red horizontal lines here, perfect for this material, because as you can see, we can scan the different uh, areas. We have a limitation of 12.5 Tesla, right? So we cannot go as far as we like, but uh, good enough to uh, get a good understanding of, of the material. Now, this is a a picture of a single crystal is a huge single crystal that we slice like this uh, that is polished. Uh, this is done in California by David Letterman. Polished and then um, 
uh, molecular bean epitaxy growth of a 10 nanometers layer of manganese difluoride on top of it, and then uh, in situ evaporation of uh, four nanometers of platinum for these experiments. Then the sample is placed at the prof of the system. Uh, magnetic fields can be applied at this position. And then two wires, very, very rudimentary um, practice of two wires in, on top of the, of the, of the crystal uh, were, were used to, to just to measure the electric field. All right, so the first thing we can do with this system is just run spectroscopy studies. And uh, well, this is a little complicated because, you know, we had to actually, Priyanka had to go five different times to Tallahassee. The samples don't like to stay under the action of a magnetic field. So <clears throat> he had, she had to repeat uh, the experiment several times and end using, I believe, 12 different samples in five trips. So I'm showing you results, spectroscopic results on three different samples. The difference between them is that they were uh, mis misaligned with respect to the application, direction of application of the magnetic field. In this case, very, very close to a perfect alignment, only one degree out. In this case, three degrees, and in this case, seven degrees. But it turns out that this actually allowed us to study things that we wouldn't have been able to do if we had a perfect alignment. So it worked out pretty well. And these color lines here are fittings, fittings uh, obtained again with the standard LLG uh, equation approach in where we add uh, the spin pumping, we can do this. Uh, the results of the calculation and the fittings of the, to the spectroscopy data are very nice. They, they, they are obtained with parameters that are, have been reported elsewhere for this material. I want to show you a little bit about the dynamics to expect when we, when we drive the system into uh, antiferromagnetic uh, resonance. And, and so when you look at the low frequency mode and you look at the, uh, the trajectories uh, that the solar magnetization describes in these cases, you'll see that the trajectory of the solar magnetization that is aligned with the magnetic field is smaller than the one that is anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And if you go to the high frequency mode, you will actually see the opposite. And that's why one goes down, the other one goes up because the, magnetic, the resulting magnetization is anti-parallel to the magnetic field in this case and parallel to the magnetic field in this case, right? Another way of looking at this is, well, let's see what happens now because we have the ability to study this uh, from the, uh, you know, in both the uh, ranges below and above the spin flow transition. So what happens with these trajectories as we move up this branch? So this is clearly the easy axis, more or less along the application of the magnetic field with the two very well circularly polarized antiferromagnetic modes. In this case, it's the high frequency mode. Then we go into the spin flow transition and you see the, the axis of uh, alignment for the nil vector, the two solaris magnetization starts tilting away from the magnetic field, but it's still a very circular polarized mode. Then we go a little farther into the spin float transition, and then we get the solaris magnetizations basically perpendicular to the applied field, as you sped up above the spin float transition, but still, you know, uh, the system maintains a pretty good uh, circular polarization. And we go, when we go farther in field, and we get in deeper into the quasi ferromagnetic mode, well, the, the, the magnetizations are basically perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, right? But also, the modes start distorting and they become more linearly polarized. And it's important because with a linear polarized mode, you don't expect spin pumping. All right, so um, beyond spectroscopy measurements, we can also report the electronic measurements, right? So the, the electric voltage that we get out of the two wires attached to the, to the sample. And this is in the black line here uh, in comparison with the EPR, the spectroscopy uh, feature. Now, don't be misled by the shape of this uh, uh, the spectroscopy feature. It's really, really noisy. And the, the reason for that is that the samples are big enough to basically distort the, uh, saturate the, the sample, the sample probe. And, and that's why we don't, we, we're not able to define very nicely the spectroscopy uh, feature as we would like, but uh, the same doesn't apply to the electric signal. 
uh, and in all cases, all these dots, we have the signal, the electric signal, exactly where we have the center of the spectroscopy signal. And then from now on, I'm gonna show you results at two different frequencies. One low frequency in where we can explore the low frequency mode, the spin flow transition, and the quasi-ferromagnetic mode. There's a typo here. This should be a Q, a Q and not an S. And then um, a high frequency in where we will, I will show you two different frequencies for, for a particular reason I will let you know later. But in, in this high frequency range, we have a look at the high frequency mode and also the spin flow transition. We cannot reach uh, the quasi-ferromagnetic mode because we have this limit in magnetic field. And, but nicely now what we can do, for example, if we go to 336 uh, gigahertz, so we just carry in the, the, uh, the energy landscape in this line, uh, we can see a positive field. We, can, we, we expect to have one peak and another peak, right? And this is what we see, uh, one peak and another peak. But now we reverse the, uh, the magnetic field, and then we will see a feature here and another feature there. So this is actually time reversal. So we expect to, to see uh, equivalent results, also not exactly the same in this particular case. But what I wanted to mention here is that we are avail uh, able to work with both right-handed uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and left-handed. And, and indeed, everything you see in red from now on is with red-handed circular polarized microwaves. And in blue is left-handed circular polarized uh, microwaves. And if you pay attention to what happens here with the main feature that corresponds to the high frequency mode is that it gives a dip in, in voltage for positive fields. It kind of, kind of disappears here. So there's a little bit of evidence there. Uh, but then uh, it gives a peak of voltage, a positive voltage when we reverse the magnetic field, negative magnetic fields, but we also reverse the uh, circular polarization of the microwaves. So we have this correspondence, a future, a future that we see here, but we don't see across, right? And then we are also observing some differences in the spin flow transition peak that I don't want to discuss right now. We'll get back to this later. We go to low frequency, 240 gigahertz, and we do the same analysis. And we see similar things, but now the low frequency mode behaves exactly opposite to the high frequency mode. So you see for <clears throat> right-handed circular polarized microwaves, we don't see a future of positive fields. When we, see a when we saw a feature for the high frequency mode that appears when we reverse the polarization of the microwave. So it's just basically the opposite two effects. That is indeed what we expect because these two anti modes are of different chirality. And we just expected to excite them only when you hit uh, the, the mode with the same chirality with your microwaves. All right, so I have a little animation here to explain this better. <clears throat> uh, and it's a little noisy, but how do I get rid of this noise? Okay. So with these no uh, microwaves, uh, these are the two, the right-handed and the left-handed modes. And those are the uh, circuits in the four different cases. Then we go and send right-handed microwaves. And we send right-handed microwaves. We will hit the right-handed mode only at high frequency and low frequency. And this is gonna pump spins in a particular direction and it's gonna generate a negative voltage in both cases. So a dip. And then if we go and use left-handed microwaves, we will only hit the left-handed mode. And this is gonna pump spins in a different direction and generate a positive, field, a positive voltage instead of a negative voltage resulting in a peak, right? This is basically what I have shown you. Well, this is the central result of this uh, work indeed. Um, uh, is what we consider proof of coherent spin pumping uh, at terahertz frequencies out of an antiferromagnetic material. <clears throat> and this is <clears throat> important because uh, this is basically what you expect, right? So if we hit the system with right-handed circular polarization, we will induce dynamics or spin pumping out of the right-handed antiferromagnetic mode with the spins down uh, uh, and, and negative voltage. If we use left-handed circular polarization, the only, the only mode that we will be able to hit is the, is the left-handed mode that has spin going up and it will result in a, in a positive voltage. 
And I say this because it is actually very common to of, of, observe spin, I mean, um, electric signals out of the inverse spin Hall effect when uh, using microwave radiation because of heating as a result of the spin Seebeck effect. But if this was the case, we will have a different behavior, right? So for example, spin Seebeck effect works as follows. We, we heat the system uh, with uh, microwaves and we heat the system. And then we establish a gradient of temperatures across the interface, well, into the, into the, inter into the device, across the interface. And that gradient of temperature is gonna, is gonna result into charged current. But that charge current is actually coming from magnet nodes from the state that is most populated. So uh, whether you hit the, the high frequency mode or the low frequency mode, the result is hitting. And as a result of hitting, the spin is effect will generate spin current uh, from the state that is most populated. And this is always the ground state. So the signal will always be positive. And if we see the, the, the observation of a reversal of the uh, signal, it is a, 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 you know, it's a really good proof of the fact that this is a, sp a coherent spin pumping instead of spin zero. The other thing we can do is to look at the magnitude. We know what the power of the microwaves we're using is at the sample position. And then we can estimate the mixing conductance. And we find it very, very close to the uh, universal quantum conductance that was actually uh, expected from theory which is actually very nice. And then in the remainder of my time, uh, maybe five, 10 minutes, I will go a little beyond the analysis of what happens be, uh, below the spin float transition into these main antiferromagnetic modes and study what happens in the spin float transition and beyond. It's actually very nice. We still don't completely understand the whole picture, but we have very nice results that I like to showcase. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is sample two. I don't want to solve results only for one sample because 336 gigahertz is a low power source. and It doesn't allow us to, to do the, the studies that I will show you. So I'm gonna compare two different samples at two different frequencies, but they basically, uh, you know, showcase the same results, but now it's more evident because we have more power, we have better signals. So, here, here, the, here, here we go, right? So we have all these panels on the top correspond to uh, 395 gigahertz. That is basically cutting the landscape here. We have one uh, mode and the spin float transition. And then all these panels on the, on, the, on the bottom part correspond to 240 gigahertz in where we have three cuts into the landscape. The low frequency mode, the spin float transition, and the quasi ferromagnetic mode. And now we have the ability to change the polarization of the microwaves continuously from right to left and back to right. And somewhere in between, we'll have fully linear, linearly polarized uh, circular polarization. This is 2D plots, this is 3D plots, and it's the same thing, but it kind of hides the visualization. So if we center on the center panels, this will have already uh, discuss right the low frequency mode, the high frequency mode. When we go into the low frequency mode with uh, left circular polarization, we actually uh, uh, meet the, the the chirality of the mode, and then we have a strong absorption. If we go to right uh, the circular polarization with the microwaves, we don't see any absorption. We have this beautiful modulation right here with the maximum and minimum, right? We reverse the magnetic field, we, we expect the, just the opposite. We move into the high frequency mode, we see exactly the, the reverse, but the same kind of phenomenon. Phenomenon. But again, I'm gonna show you what happens beyond, beyond those points. So we go to the spin flow transition. Uh, what we see is very similar behavior of the spin flow transition peak. Uh, as a, when compared to the high frequency mode. So basically strong, strong absorption when right circular polarization is, uh, is directed uh, here and here, uh, very weak, also not zero. There's some background signal in the spin flow transition that is not in the high frequency mode. And when we reverse the field, it's the same thing, right? 
So somehow, and you look at the three-dimensional picture, it's basically behaving the same way, right? So uh, close into the spin flow transition, the system, you know, remembers the, the high frequency mode nature. Uh, if we go deeper into the spin flow uh, transition, uh, things are a little different. I mean, the symmetry is the same. So we have a minimum when we have a minimum in the in the high frequency mode, but now the signal has totally reversed. And this is a surprise, we didn't expect this. We cannot still not, don't, we cannot even uh, explain it with the theory that we have used. And then of course we can keep going into the quasi ferromagnetic mode and then we see a totally different behavior. Basically there's no modulation and the signal is again positive instead of negative. All right, so the way we, we have to understand this in a few words and with this I will finish. It's just following this branch. I cannot follow this branch for a single sample because as I say, we have taken measurements on two different samples for, this, for these measurements, but it's kind of the same thing. The only difference is that the misalignment is slightly different. And then if we go to low fields below the spin flow transition, this is a spin flow transition, right? Low fields, we're here. Remember, this is the, the expectation we have a very circular polarized uh, antiferromagnetic mode. And, and then this is what we observe, right? So for positive fields, we observe this uh, modulation that is reversed for negative fields as expected for this mode. Then we keep going, we go to the spin flow transition. Now we, we see something that is basically similar, right? In nature and similar in, in behavior. We keep going down and now we are in a different thing, right? So we still have some kind of, you know, memory of the circular polarization. The, the mode is still circularly polarized, but now we're far from the uh, being aligned with the AC axis, and so we have some uh, futures as we had before, like the same modulation as a function of the phase of polarization of the microwaves, but the the signal is actually totally reversed. And if we go to the Quasi ferromagnetic mode, look at what happens here. Now we're still, we're already having some linear, I mean, you know, elliptical polarization and eventually it will become fully linear. So we don't really expect strong spin pumping out of this mode. Uh, and that is maybe why this is not modulated. And what it makes us to believe that the reversal of the, of the sign of the inverse spin hole effect voltage and this positive voltage that we obtain in the quasi ferromagnetic mode are most likely coming from the spin Seebach effect. So the spin Seebach effect is going to be more, it's going to be stronger when we have a, a system developing an equilibrium magnetization. Remember now the Solaris magnetizations are canted slightly towards the magnetic field. That equilibrium magnetization can give rise to uh, a much stronger spin Seebach effect in the material. But as I said, Actually, we try to run uh, calculations with the standard theory, the formal theory that I described before. We can fit this very well, for example, but if we fit this with the same parameters, we will be actually very far from fitting the rest of, of, the, of the observations. Those dots here, those, this data here is basically the height of these curves, right? For different uh, polarization of the microwave. And this is basically what I wanted to discuss today, and I'm done, and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you uh, very much, Enrique. That was excellent, so maybe everybody can raise their hands to clap. As you can see, Enrique can see you. Uh, you have everybody clapping from the, I think we're all together on the, between Zoom and, uh, and uh, YouTube, about 300 people that right. have been attending. Um, and then I think now we have uh, the, the talk up for questions. Uh, let me uh, ask the first one in here. Uh, I think is, let me promote, I'm oh, sorry, okay, promote to, okay, I think I just, uh, okay. So Shunling Wang, uh, could you uh, go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes. So uh, uh, I'm a postdoc with Alan McDonald in Austin, Texas. And so I have a few questions. So uh, you see the linearly polarized mode cannot pump spin. Uh, can you elaborate that more? Well, I know the, I'm not a theorist, but uh, my understanding is that if you have a circular polarized mode and you follow the, and this is, this, 
applies both to uniaxial systems and easy plane systems, right? But if you if you you have a you have a circular polarized like a uh, mode, you'll have one Solaris magnetization processing making a cone, and the other one processing in the opposite direction making a slightly different cone, and this gives rise to a it gives rise to an oscillating magnetic moment, if you want, right? Uh, as a result, if you if you make them all more and more elliptical and eventually linear, now the two solaris magnetizations will oscillate in a plane, and this is going to prevent uh, the spin pumping to be such efficient. That is my my understanding, but this is a very poor understanding, or uh, with a very that's a correct one. Okay. <laughs> Visualization. Uh, okay, can I just ask one more? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, you, you show this deep in the quasi uh, magnon branch uh, as a function of the magnetic field, uh, I believe. Yes. So, uh, so uh, is there a way you can somehow generate some sort of a magnon condensate around there? Uh, Oh no, this is a minimum. I mean, this is not a mini an energy minimum. This is so a, that's, uh... this is a this is a minimum a minimum in the strength of the voltage that we obtain as we as we change the polarization of the microwaves. Ah. Yeah, this is okay. not a, this is not the magnet dispersion of sorts, huh? Okay, okay, okay. In that okay. case, Thank you. no. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Uh, so then let me uh, ask Helen, uh, go ahead. Uh, you can unmute your, yourself and ask the question, Helen. I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I can, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have several questions and uh, comments. First uh, question is, uh, are you sure that you excite res um, K0 magnons or you have no idea which kind of magnons do you excite? I mean that the magnons with K0, with non-zero wave vector can also contribute into your signal. Yes, so my, my belief is that at low fields below the speed, spin from transition, uh, the excitation also is, a, is a K0 mode, is the main uh, coherent uh, antiferromagnetic resonance mode. Uh, when we get into the beyond the spin flow transition in particular, most likely those are non-K0 uh, non modes, and, and those magnums are most likely generating electric signals as a result of the spin civil effect. That's my understanding. Although we don't have conclusive evidence of this, and we, we want to do some more follow-up experiments. And what is the size of your sample? So how large uh, is the area from which you get your signal? Those are pretty large. They are up to three millimeter by three millimeter. And uh, the second question at the first slide, or in the first slides, you show the group velocity going as a square root of the frequency. Uh, what is the origin of this? Because uh, as far as I understand, it should be inversely proportional. Uh, that is maybe true. I may, may, it may be my typo. Oh, okay. And uh, one comment. Uh, so <laughs> I understand that you work, uh, you are working with Serang Chang and uh, maybe Himin, and so you are citing them, but uh, we get uh, these results and predictions m much earlier than uh, about this uh, possible uh, oscillations and the dynamics induced by currents and all these equations. So yeah, you have to be I careful with Helen because she is the, she is the Bible of antiferromagnetic spectronics, as you know, and uh, many of these things. <laughs> Some form of another show up somewhere. It's okay. Helen, sorry, I didn't. It was not our. Um, definitely not my intention to. No, not to not to cite your your works. I, the, the fact is that I mean these experiments initiated uh, from a visit uh, by Arnie Bradas to our department uh, shortly after he published the physical letters paper in where he studied the spin pumping in antiferromagnets. And then at that same moment, I started thinking about how to realize the experiment demonstration, the experimental demonstration. So it may be my bias that I have been following his, his paper exclusively, right? And also because the collaborators in our community team, both Ran Chen and me, uh, maybe we have 
I'm, I'm so sorry. We have missed some of your. That's no problem. It's okay. I don't think I don't think Ellen meant it that way. It's just simply to be aware that some yeah. actually in some of those papers there's some possibilities to uh, to dig a bit more into uh, into some of the physics that may be relevant for the for the experiments. I think it's more for relevance to the experiments that she meant that. And one more question, the spin mix and conductance. So we're also working a little bit with the uh, insulators, but uh, um, I understand the spin mix and uh, conductance concept for the metallic materials, but here we are talking about the insulators. Uh, so how can you explain it physically? Well, my understanding is that uh, at the interface, this basically not the big, I mean, there's not a big difference if you just look at the interface uh, when it comes down to uh, a spin transfer in between two materials. Uh, definitively, you need conduction electrons to move, but those will be in platinum, and this is a conductor, right? But my understanding is that the spin mix and conductance analysis works from insulator to insulator, actually, in, in kind of the same way. Because it's just yeah, a- Because it's tunneling, uh, effectively, right? It's, it's a concept of tunneling. It has. Yeah, but I, and you're asking me questions that should be... Yeah, that is not fair for you, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Helen, that's it. No, no, no more tough questions. Let, let's, let's give the floor to Matthias. You wanted to ask a question? Uh, yes, so firstly, thanks for the nice talk. So I'm also a humble experimentalist, so just easy questions. Um, so you mentioned that spin pumping only works for circularly polarized magnets because only they carry angular momentum. However, in the easy plane phase of an antiferromagnet, the polarization depends on the K vector. So for small K vectors, you have mostly circularly polarized magnons. And then at the Brian zone boundary, you go to linearly polarized magnons. So I wonder, is there a way to quantify the polarization, the ellipticity, and then from that learn which magnons contribute to the pump current? Uh, that, is a, that is maybe one way of going. Because definitively, we don't think that the that the electric signal that we observe beyond the the spin flow transition relates to circular polarized modes of the antiferromagnet, and most likely come from linear. Actually, it cannot come from linear polarized modes, so it has to come from a different kind of modes, magnet modes. But but it's something that we we're trying to explore. Uh, it's not this is not easy experiments. Um, but yeah, there's way to to try to to. To study this along the lines that you're su suggesting. Yeah. In in uh, in uh, easy plane antiferromagnets, it is my understanding that, uh, that at low at low magnetic fields, uh, the the modes are also linear polarized. Like for example, ni nickel oxide. So you wouldn't expect any spin pumping out of a, out of nickel oxide in principle. And that's one of the things we want to try because you know it's, it's a pity, but that's what it looks to happen in nickel oxide. According great. to Sarah. Yeah, great, thanks. And I think it's really a hero experiment. This is really yeah, tough. Yeah, it was a, it's a very, it's, it's, that's the, it is a really tough experiment that they did. Yeah, exactly, that's just not, uh, it's easy to put it in theory, but it's extremely hard to do it. That's why it's a science paper. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Branislav, uh, good to see you there. Uh, did you have a question? Or you had, uh, I guess he had, he had his hand up, so I'm not sure if Branislav uh, Nikolic uh, wanted to ask a question or not. No, I don't think so. So I'm going go to say, I have to say also, Jairo, that um, a very similar uh, uh, results uh, than, than, you know, similar yeah. to the ones that, that I have presented have been published very recently in actually even before our, our paper in science uh, they published in in the university of california riverside yeah i know, I know uh, yeah, Shane, so he had he had to meet uh, he had shared with me some of the results and i told him about that you guys were competing so you guys knew about each other yeah, beautiful work beautiful work they they, they have evidence of coherent spin pumping but also yeah. they see that in their case spin sivak effect dominates and and they see how and they analyze as a function of temperature something that we haven't done yet and they see how can they they see, you know, like one or the other effect dominating at different temperature ranges. And that's actually a very nice experiment as well in, in exactly the same way that we have done it, but in chromium oxide. Okay. So I have another person, Beatrice. Uh, did you have a question? You have your hand up. 
I don't know if uh, because having your hand up to me means that there's a question, but I'm not sure if that's uh, uh, or not. Okay, you kind of mute yourself. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just had my kept my hand up because of the clapping before. Okay, no problem. <laughs> sorry. <a> problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, is there any other uh, that wants to ask a question, or uh, uh, I think oh, there's, there's a couple more. So let me. Uh, if you have your hand up, I'm going to open your voices. So Revas, uh, Revas, can you please ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is: uh, so in this in the, in this story that you told us, there are no charge carriers involved. Is well, that not, not in the antiferromagnet. The antiferromagnetic is an insulator, but platinum, of course, is a conductor. Uh, and so what's, what's their role in the picture? Uh, so let me, let me try to go to the place in where I can show you. The principle of operation should be, where should it be? Here. So, so this is the this is the illustration of our experiment, right? So we have a magnetic material, and we apply a magnetic field. We drive the system, the antiferromagnet that is an insulator into antiferromagnetic resonance, and so the magnetization in this case the needle vector starts processing, and in every cycle of processing there is a spin angular momentum, a unit, a quantum, um, that can be taken by conduction electrons in platinum, in a way that uh, so, you know, one electron, one conduction electron in platinum will go into the interface somehow with a given polarization direction and the other one away with the opposite. So there won't be any charge, net charge current perpendicular to the interface, but only a spin current. The spin current is going to be diffused. It's going to decay as we move away. And that spin current is going to be converted in platinum because of the high spin orbit coupling in platinum and the, uh, by means of this inverse spin Hall effect into a charge current laterally that we, that we can detect by applying two wires at the two ends of the, of the sample. So the electric current that we measure, the voltage that we measure is proportional to the spin current that is being injected from the antiferromagnet undergoing uh, antiferromagnetic resonance into platinum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let me then, uh, the last one, I think, uh, Shivalik Lairi, uh, could you ask your question, please? Uh, uh, hello, so wonderful talk, first of all. Uh, well, my question is actually, if, uh, it might be repetitive. Uh, in the last part, you said in spin flop mode, the effect is, is the effect due to dominating Seebeck effect or uh, the sum of both the coherent spin pumping or a C and Seebeck effect? Well, when. Uh, we believe that is most likely coming only from the Seebeck effect. Uh, the reason we believe this to be the case is because we don't see any modulation, as we as we had seen in 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 you know at lower magnetic fields, right? Uh, there is no modulation, and also the signal is is uh, positive and uh, opposite to the one that we would expect from spin pumping, coherent spin pumping. And indeed, if you if you if you connect this. That, that I'm pointing here, I don't know if you see my cursor, but let me just use the pointer. So if, if this, this line, you can actually make a connection to the spin flow transition. Remember I told you there is some background signal, it doesn't really yeah. disappear, but it looks to be about the same. So it's most likely this coming from spin Seebeck effect. Uh, once we move uh, across the spin flow transition with the develop an equilibrium magnetization from the canting of the solarises, and that is going to, Amplify, it will make the spin uh, Seebeck effect much more efficient. That is not to be expected at lower fields. Okay. You could still have it, but you know, if you just work with K0 modes, in principle, you shouldn't be. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that clears my question. Do work on. Okay, I think uh, that was all the questions we had so far. So with that, I would like to again to ask uh, everybody to thank Enrique for a wonderful talk, a very clear talk uh, on, on a wonderful, uh, very tough experiment that they achieved. Um, and I let you maybe say the last few words, uh, Enrique, if you like to say goodbye to the well, team. I, 
I, I, do, I know what you want. You want me to bring you a couple of uh, bottles of wine next time. I, I, I thought we were talking cases of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Don't bring them. You're not allowed to bring them in the plane. You can bring them here. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for paying attention to my talk. <laughs>